very fortunate they obviously been crossing over with the uh, Sports Science and Medicine Conference and we're very fortunate to have Dave, Dr. Dave Mishmanala, our head, uh, um, uh, Chief Medical Officer for the uh, basketball and um, he's obviously going to take us through a very important aspect from the game which is cushions. So um, hopefully uh, bring us up to speed with modern where we're at with the world of concussions. So I'll leave you with Dave. Right, right, right. How you guys doing? I'm going to try and talk loudly, I guess, because this is going to be a challenge. Okay, um, so as Brian said, uh, so my name's Dane, so I do a lot of the basketball stuff, so Chief Medical Officer of Basketball England, and the plan today is to just go through concussion with you, um, and hopefully to have a bit of a conversation as well, because there will be challenges from your end, and there'll be challenges from our end in terms of how basketball works, um, and hopefully we can work through those together and give you a baseline as well. Um, so do share any experiences that you have. Okay. Um, just to give you a bit of my background, just so you can see where I'm coming from, so please tell me where you're coming from. Um, apart from the basketball stuff, my job initially was uh, training as a GP, uh, working mainly in A&E. Uh, and then I retrained, I got bored of GP because 10 minute points are quite hard to keep your sanity. Uh, so I went back to training and I, uh, so I'm now a consultant in sports medicine working out at York Hospital. So I do a little bit of an A&E and a little bit of sports medicine. Um, so my main rugby team now is the rugby league team. Um, so we deal with about one to two concussions a week um, and the same with football, probably maybe one a month. Can you guys hear me well enough for me to carry you struggling? Okay, fine. What do you reckon? Go, stay, go. Yeah, cool. That's quite enough. Okay. Um, so I guess I'm seeing concussion in a variety of sports. Our biggest challenge in basketball is how does that relate to all the other sports? What's the consensus in this country, but also what's realistic to us? Um, and I think in terms of this year alone, through Basketball England GB, probably had about seven or eight concussions that we're aware of centrally. There's probably more than that that has been managed at a local level. Um, so it's actually a lot more prevalent than we think. Okay. My basketball bit of the CV because you're coaches, so I thought I should get in my little bit because I never get to put this on my CV anymore. Uh, I did my level two coaching badge a while back in 07. Uh, I did my level three with Mark Dunning. Is he still around? Mark Dunning? Um, I never submitted the final bit of player improvement framework. Um, yeah, so never went there. Um, and then I coached some university teams for a while. So I have a vague understanding of what you guys do, but it's a very low level in comparison to the levels that you do it at. Um, but hopefully I kind of get where you're at, hopefully. Um, and me and Vanessa have had conversations about concussions for and with a few others. So again, I start to see where your challenges lie. Okay, so plan today is to go through a definition of concussion so you can see what the whole spectrum looks like. Then talk to you a bit about consequences. Why are we so bothered about this to the extent that we are? Then talk about how we're going to identify it. Talk a little bit about management and then really to have a uh, conversation with you guys around challenges. And hopefully to help you influence what our concussion policy should be because it's up for review at the moment. And I think it's a really important time to do that. I think there's a few face in the room that already said they've volunteered to have a review of that paper for us, so that would be useful. Okay, so uh, first question for you, what clock is this? Countdown, yeah. Um, okay, chuck out definitions of concussion. How would you explain to someone that there is a concussion? What would the words be that you use to explain to someone? Head injury? Sorry? Forgetfulness? Dizzy? Feeling sick? Yeah, so some kind of impact. No spatial awareness. No spatial awareness. Delay. Yeah, so slowness, delay. Okay, this is really good. I thought someone was going to come out with knocked out, so that wasn't the case. That's really good. Sometimes you go to like particularly football ones and the coach goes, they got knocked out, and that is the end of it. So that's really good. Okay. Um, so in terms of a definition of concussion, this is your spectrum. So you've got the severe end, so this is your bleed in your brain. This is the stuff that we worry about missing. Um, and there's been a number of incidents of death recently. There was one in boxing, obviously not the same as basketball, but there was quite a large one recently. There's been a couple of concussion deaths now in a range of sports, um, including basketball um, on a worldwide basis, but not in the UK for basketball that we know of. 
Okay. But concussion is still a traumatic brain injury. And I guess the big issue here and the challenge we have generally is that people see a muscle, see an injury, and it's very easy to understand. The challenge with the brain is you can feel slowed down, I think, as you said. And actually, most people think you still look normal. And actually, maybe you're a high-level playing uh, player with high IQ. You could probably get by with a concussion and still sub-perform, but still get there. And you guys might be the first person to notice this guy's not firing all the cylinders. He's not getting the plays right. He's not moving as usual. He's making decisions that he wouldn't normally make. Does that make sense? So you might spot stuff that isn't the obvious stuff. And I think sometimes it's those bits that we miss and they come back too early. So this is our sports concussion. And our challenge is how do we miss this stuff? I think if they're on the severe end, they've lost consciousness, they're vomiting constantly, they don't have a clue what's going on. I think everyone's quite happy that they're out. It's that in-between stuff where we start to risk it. Um, so I'll go through the consequences of that. So this is a traumatic brain injury. In terms of definitions, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but just to bring back, so it's an impulsive force, so that hit on the head that you talked about earlier. Um, but this is the key thing. Symptoms might evolve over minutes or hours. Um, so that's not everyone has symptoms immediately. Um, so the key thing, particularly in the clubs that we work with, is, well, actually, if you see them then, but you're not going to see them for a few days, who is going to see them and follow them up? Was there an event that you go, you know what, they're OK, I'm happy at the moment, but what's my safety net? Who's following them up? And that's always a challenge for us. And also it depends on, because basketball's got an interesting demographic, and so it depends on what's their situation at home. Have they got people who look out for them that are going to take responsibility for them over the next 72 hours? That's the kind of conversations we're having. Um, same challenges in football, um, and it's who's looking after you. So it's that safeguarding element there. Then we've got this, do we need images? Most images or MRIs or CTs don't pick up a concussion, or they can't. Um, so the important thing is you can't rule out a concussion because the, the scan was normal. Does that make sense? Um, it doesn't pick up on 2019 scans, maybe in the future. There's a bit of research going on about salivary tests to look for proteins that change but we don't have anything yet. So everything is a clinical decision that's made. Okay. Yeah. Can you explain what an impulsive force is as opposed to a regular force? It's the same thing. Um, I've just literally pulled their definition. So it's taken off a medical definition. So exactly the same. So the fact that it's just been transmitted and you get a force. Yeah. It's like most things in medicine. We try and make it more complicated than it really is. Uh, that's probably a fair comment. But then actually there's a ton of stuff in basketball coaching that you guys come out with and like, could have just said he's on the other side of the court. Um, so yeah, I think it works in all uh, specialisms, doesn't it? Um, okay, and this is your impulsive force, isn't it? So think about your skull. Once you're, once you're basically an adolescent, your skull is basically formed. It's no longer soft and is pliable. So ultimately any force in the brain, that skull, uh, that brain is moving back and forth inside the skull. So that's bruising immediately. But bruising to that structure may not be so obvious as it is to a, to a calf or an Achilles or something else. And I guess this is what we're worried about. So, show you this. This is 2018 playoffs. I um, don't know if you remember it. So this is Kevin Love. I think it was game six, wasn't it? Um, he goes down just grabbing a board, um, gets elbowed, I think, and then lands. Um, but actually... He's still down, but he's talking. He hasn't lost consciousness. He's able to get himself back up. But if you look at the video, he's taking his time, so he's slower anyway. Um, the video will show a fairly decent contact. You know, he's your perfect coach's play. He's trying to take the charge, isn't he? But it's fallen flat on his face because of it. Um, so now he's out. NBA concussion protocols, he came back probably a little bit quicker than he should have done. That's the pressures of the game, isn't it? So he was out, he missed their next game. Can't remember the outcome after that, but... Um, so not every concussion is, a, you know, he must be obviously on the floor, lost consciousness. So that was him out for quite a while. And I think uh, talking to some of the staff that looked after him, sounds like he had further episodes post uh, in terms of symptoms. So this is our challenge, when are we ready? Okay, so I want to show you some data. Um, most of our data, and I think this is hopefully something with Steve we're trying to rectify, is most of our injury data is very much uh, NCAA based. We don't have a lot of data for the UK. In fact, we have almost no data for the UK that is, apart from you guys, maybe in your own clubs doing something, um, it's not shared on a cohesive basis for us to do something with it. 
Um, so this is data taken from quite a long period of time. So 3.6% of all NCAA uh, related injuries uh, for basketball um, were concussion. So that's actually quite high for basketball, which is considered a non-contact sport. Um, American Journal of Sports Medicine puts it um, at an incidence that's higher than football. Um, which again, so you think about football, so a heading game, there's, you might think there's more risk. Technically, basketball has a higher risk or a higher incident. So again, football is well ahead of us, rugby is well ahead of us in terms of just managing it. Um, so it's where do we go to try and protect or mitigate these risks, particularly when we've got younger kids with us as well, who we've got a duty of care. Um, and arguably many of them cannot make the decision required. We have to make it for them. They're not old enough and mature enough to decide that it matters in 10 years. They care about playing tomorrow. And most of them care about impressing you and they don't want to let you down. Is that probably fair to many of them? Um, so it's kind of you having to probably make that difficult decision and reassure them that you know that they're out for a good reason, I guess. But this, this was the key thing that came out of that paper. It's actually more common in basketball than most people thought. So I'm going to just quickly run through some basics, but obviously there's only so much you can cover in any period of time. So um, I guess the first thing is, were there any symptoms? How many of you have got a physio with you in, or a sports therapist with you in your club uh, while at all training and all match days that are watching play? Okay, so that means you are, unfortunately it sucks to be you, but you are everything, aren't you? You're the jack of all trades. You have to have a medical knowledge, which in fairness, the rugby and the football coach on the whole don't, do they? So um, you are probably the person making these decisions to some extent, um, which gives you a high, high level of responsibility on that front and puts you in a very conflicted position, doesn't it? You've got your best player, you might think they're concussed, if you were a medic or someone independent, you're going to say they're concussed. But actually, if you've got two plates to spin, that's quite a challenge. Well, I would find that a challenge as well. Um, so any symptoms, and we'll talk through the symptoms, they should be removed. If you think there's a possible mechanism, so they got hit on the head or they landed on the head, but actually they get up, they've got no symptoms and they look like they're playing fine, then ultimately the beauty of our sport is we can remove them and they can still come back on unlike other sports. So ideally we need to recognise, remove, and then we need to look for an assessment. And the assessment is gonna be where we decide who's there and how do you want to play it. Um, so remove and assess would be next. If they're symptomatic, that is a concussion. And the critical thing to say here is, you guys make the decision on court side. It shouldn't be made by a hospital, um, by no means at all. So interestingly, which we might not be aware of, um, doctors in a hospital setting and GP setting are not trained to manage concussion, they're trained to manage a bleed to the brain. Does that make sense? So they're there to go, do we need to operate and evacuate a bleed? Do we need to admit them? If it's not those things, they might say it's concussion, they might not, but if you ask them, what do I need to do next? Unless they have an interest in sport and they've done it for another reason, it's not compulsory mandatory training. Does that make sense? Which is why we have, Sometimes you go to ED department, there'll be a sports doctor who'll say, this is what you need to do. And another one will say, oh, he's fine, no bleed, crack on. And then you suddenly start to get these conflicting reports, which undermines you, which undermines the message from there. And then the parents start to get confused. Well, the specialists at the hostel say they were fine. And there's a confusion around what the competencies are. Does that make sense? Um, so when we send them to hospital, if you're worried that they lost consciousness, they're vomiting, there's other issues going on, you're sending them to rule out a bleed to the brain. You're not sending them because you want to rule out concussion. Does that make sense? You decide the concussion when they leave here. And we need to make it clear to them, this is a concussion. You're only going to make sure there's nothing else going on. You will always have this amount of time off. And it's kind of getting into that rhythm of doing that. Um, and our biggest challenge is these guys, if the parents don't buy in, they're going and playing football, rugby, basketball somewhere else in their own time if it's a child. Um, I guess with the men's game, hopefully they're only playing with you guys, so it's a bit easier to probably police. So ED is there to just do intracranial, so inside the head pathology, so bleeds. And this is our challenge, which we'll come back to on policy. Is this, are these challenges you're having? I'm seeing them, so is this things you've had? Has anyone had a case recently they wanted to talk about or mention around this? Um, so obviously made sure she was okay to get up, took her off and she started to feel sick. Yeah. So called the parent over and that was that she's done, can't play. They then took her to hospital, obviously they then told her that she was okay. 
So then I was trying to explain, no, we have to follow the concussion guidelines. You can't train at the moment. And there was a bit of yeah. confusion by the parent. And yeah. I was like, no, this is what we as coaches have to follow. Yeah. So there was a little bit of... Yeah, and I was trying to think, how do we make this easier? Because it isn't easy for you as well. Because if a parent then goes, well, they're fine. And to be fair, the next day they can be completely fine, can't they, in themselves? And then you, your challenge is the parents say in this and the hospital support to them and suddenly it's you against two. Um, and I think that's where I think we're looking at developing some kind of pre-made template sheet with advice, trying to make that more rigid, that has the backing of the organisation behind you that you give to them when you go to a &E. Um, and I think what I might do if you're happy is send it out to you guys because you might read it and go, this makes no sense. It's got jargon on it that it shouldn't have. And it would be really useful to get that feedback. But we're trying to get it to a page. I'm hoping to try and get it out over the next few weeks. Jane, we had the situation with a couple of players last year. Yeah. And one of them, because she was national teams player, and the parents then wanted to get her back on the floor quicker, and she did the same thing. Yeah. And created some conflict. Yeah. What I really wanted to do was be able to go, right, here you go, go online to BE. Here's the protocol, but more importantly, here's what you should be observing and looking for yourself as parents over the next period of time. Yeah. Because I'm only going to see this. Yeah. See your daughter yeah. three times a week, but you, you, because of the advice also, because they're also responsible for school. Yeah. Because of the implications, yeah. should they be at school the next day? Should they be in a classroom? Should they be in learning? Yeah. Should they be on a screen? There's all sorts of things that it's the parents, the only person really, yeah. who's in a position to see that. And if there was something there, yeah. up, it would be really powerful. powerful. Yeah. And I think, no, that's useful. Um, I think we'll, we'll try and get something out over the next few weeks in a draft format, see what you guys think. And then please just give me your honest feedback and we'll revise it till it's, it feels fit for purpose. Um, but yeah, definitely, because I think we've got, we've got the guidelines, but it's kind of jargony and more aimed at the physio, isn't it, than it is at um, the parent or the coaches. Is it one symptom and a symptom concussion? Because like, if someone gets hit on the head, you're probably going to have a headache. Yep. But for me, that may not necessarily be concussion if you don't have multiple symptoms. So that kid that has to be played for, is it 28 days or 20 yeah. days? Yeah, so a period of time, so yeah. Is it multiple symptoms or is it certain symptoms? Or and, and I think this is the complete challenge of concussion. It's not an easy diagnosis on the lower end. So you, you are having to make a judgment call. Um, so my motto with this is quite straightforward. I think particularly with the kids, I think seniors is a little bit more and that's where it gets grey. I think with kids, it's... Um, their kids take longer to uh, heal from a concussion and they have worse outcomes. So if there's a mechanism you see and they have one symptom, then from my point of view, if it was my child or anyone else's, knowing the long-term implications of missing it, I'd have a lower threshold to call it concussion. Does that make sense? So we definitely, I reckon there's probably a few we overdiagnose, but I think given the limitations, we have to over because you don't want to miss them instead. Does that make sense? So I think, if tests get better, we can get better at it. At the moment, I think if there's a mechanism that you think is clear and there's a symptom, I don't think you have a choice in this day and age either. But not, then you'll run into the problem like, you know, the kids are going to see this happening, see so and so sitting out for three weeks because they said, oh, my head hurts. Yeah. And now they're going to get up, this is the floor, they're going to get up and they'll be smart enough to say, no, I'm fine. I'm yeah. Fine, no problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I mean, the, these are the challenges, concussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think this is where it's player... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think there is no easy answer to that. It's about... And I think that's where you guys are better than the physios because you know your players. You know when someone is not right to some extent, probably more than they're likely to come and tell a medic, even if you had a medic with you. Um, A lot of these situations that happen where we might be on our own, right, in clubs. And I think that's something we can all look at to make sure you've got assistance and other parents to help you with these guidelines. And just a thought would be to share this and make sure that when we get to the, the finished document, that it's on every table when every game is being played as well. So you've then yeah. got at least two table officials who will more than likely be adults, yeah. two referees that are paid to be responsible for the yeah. safety of the game and two coaches home and away. Yeah. So if you can get it to be put with table officials and yeah. referees, then you then have a, a group of adults that are all looking at something very, very similar. Yeah, and sharing the same knowledge base to make that decision. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, something we could definitely look at, yeah. What is the teaching to schools with regards to concussion? Because surely the, in 
guessing they must have something in their safety policies. So it well. depends on, uh, so RFE, so Rugby Football Union, have got some e-learning and stuff that the coaches there do and some of the school staff do, but nothing's mandatory, um, hence the challenge. Um, so yeah, schools that generally tend to play rugby tend to have a better system, but again, it depends on the coaches that are there for basketball or, or other sports. Um, it's, it's definitely a big issue at the moment. Um, okay, so I just want to talk through key consequences so you understand the magnitude of missing a few and why it's better to have a lower threshold, in, in my opinion, for the moment. Um, so consequences-wise, I won't bore you with this diagram, but um, if any of you remember back to your PE biology stuff, um, we're talking about axons, synapses and what goes on. So I'm just going to take the key bits out, so it's just there almost as a, as a background. If you get hit in the head, you get a massive change in your potassium, so K plus that you can see going out. If you get K plus going out, yeah, so potassium goes out, you need to pump it back in to be, bring you back into equilibrium. ATP, do you remember energy? Yeah. So you need lots and lots of glucose energy, ATP, to bring you back to equilibrium. So your brain requires a ton of glucose after concussion. So if you're, depending on what you're like, you might be able to maintain your functions because you've got enough glucose going on. But what other things require lots of glucose for the brain? What other activities? Sorry? Yeah, so just general day-to-day -day stuff requires glucose. So just general day-to-day -day living requires a lower level of glucose all the time to the brain. Yeah, and then what other higher level functions do? Anaerobic exercises or sprinting. Okay, so the higher the uh, heart rates that you generate, the more the glucose is required to the brain because the brain needs glucose. It can't use other fuel sources. Um, Schoolwork, watching TV, going on your phone, all of those things, and then exercise. So if you think about an injured thing that you can't see and they might not be able to have any symptoms for and you only see a mechanism, they now need more glucose. If we tax them so they still have to go to school, they still are playing basketball tomorrow, there's going to be a deficit and there's going to be damage to that nerve. Does that make sense? That's our biggest worry. It's the long-term implication. Short-term, it's hard to notice most of these things. Um, so basically, there is more oxygen. Uh, sorry, you need more oxygen, but you get less because you need more glucose and there's inflammation. And at this point, if someone is hit and goes back and plays, the risk of getting a bleed on their second hit is very, very high. And that's usually the cause of death. It's a second hit syndrome. You think they're okay, they go back on um, and they get hit. Uh, ACLs are higher if you're concussed because your coordination's gone. So, you know, big life career threatening injuries are higher if that person is not quite with it. Um, and I guess this is what we're worried about. So if you're unsure as well, you know, is it worth the risk, not just for the second hit syndrome or is it a concussion? Is there a high risk of a, a career ending injury or a significant injury here? Uh, and I guess these are the things we worry about. And the last thing is this thing called uh, CTE, so chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Then have you watched the Will Smith movie? On concussion. So he was a neurologist that found that in uh, NFL um, they were all these players that were basically starting to get these dementia-like syndromes early so they were starting to be forgetful, get um, addictions, they were starting to get aggressive um, but you could only find out when you looked to their brain post-death on autopsy and their brain had shriveled um, and looked quite different. We don't know how many impacts it takes to do that we don't know how long we need to leave for a brain to heal. So if you get a mild concussive injury and you think, well, they're fine, but you saw a mechanism, it was clear. Well, actually, if they come back and practice tomorrow and the day after, they still go to school, they're doing everything else and their glucose requirement is high, their oxygen levels are low, are they causing damage longer term? Uh, and this is what we don't know. There is definitely an absence of information. So we have to protect uh, our youth uh, from those risks ultimately at this point in time. Um, so it's really interesting. If you haven't seen the movie, it's, it's worth having a watch of as well. Um, you know, we haven't got the problem that uh, NFL does or the other sports do, but at the same time, I think some bits we're not looking for it either. Um, whereas rugby and uh, NFL have. So have a look if you're interested. Wanted to play you this. Just play the first three minutes of it. If you haven't seen this before. You won't be able to hear this well enough, will you? Can't hear it. That's as loud as it goes, isn't it? I haven't played rugby yet. I didn't think too much about it. I thought, oh. I'll talk you through it instead. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the story of Ben Robinson? Has anyone? 
Okay, so Ben Robinson, uh, uh, 2011, uh, 14 years old, was playing rugby, um, just coaches, um, I think it was schoolboy level. Um, he got hit, this is his dad talking through it, but he basically got hit. They weren't sure, um, I think the coach put some fingers up, um, said he was fine, he looked fine, he was happy to go on, he said he told everyone he felt fine. Um, he joked he couldn't remember the tackle and then he went back. Um, he got hit again, um, got up and said he was fine, he came off, coaches had a quick look, he was fine, went on for the third time. At this point his mum on the sideline was pretty much screaming that there's a problem with him. Uh, got hit for the third time, uh, went down, uh, had a bleed to his brain and, and died um, consecutively, I think within a day or two. Um, so there was a big uh, inquest off the post out of what was coaching education look like. Um, you know, when, how do we pick up stuff? We should have a low threshold for removal, those kind of conversations. Um, so they put a lot of funding into school education. So he runs a charity now, which is literally around educating parents and coaches. Um, so worth having a look at that video if you get time. It's quite sad uh, for obvious reasons, but I think this is our ultimate worry. And it's quite easy for us in basketball to say it hasn't happened yet. But at some point it's going to come to us potentially. And what we have to do is mitigate those risks where we can, without obviously having scare tactics to a point where we can't make reasonable decisions. Um, but also, medico-legally, we're in an era now where uh, the customer is always right, people can always sue, and people always feel they're right. Um, no one will thank you afterwards for letting them play a few extra minutes if it went wrong, and we all know that. So you have to protect yourself slightly as well, I feel. Um, the same way medics do a lot of the time, we're quite protecting the way we practice medicine because you can't do anything else these days. Um, so there are lots of tools and I'll talk you through that, but ultimately that's the sad story of Ben Robinson. Um, so he was what sparked quite a lot of the educational changes now happening. Um, but this has now happened in the UK quite a few times in a variety of sports. And you shouldn't be going to sport and ending up dead really, should you? I mean, it shouldn't really happen. Okay, so how do we identify it? Um, so there's lots of signs and symptoms. I'll, I'll put, post you this stuff to look at in more detail, but we can look at it in terms of, do they have physical signs? Do they have behavior changes? Do they have cognitive changes? And do they have sleep changes? So I'm not gonna go through more in turn to try and get through, because we've already had a bit of conversation, but these are some of the physical signs you're gonna see. I'll send out this presentation as well if you guys want it. Um, but you know, these are all the things we're worried about, anything, but some of these are vague. What does dazed mean? You know, that's, that's a look in someone's eyes that you see and you go, something's not right. It's not someone necessarily telling you that all the time, is it? And particularly, I find in some sports, guys are like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I don't, I don't want you coming near me. I want to stay on. Um, so it's, do you see it? And I think you will see it more than anyone else. Um, in rugby for us and in basketball ones that I've covered, sometimes a coach sees it first because they know that player. They're like, why are they going off on that play? And we're like, oh, there was an injury back. Do we need to have another quick look at it and pull them off? Um, so I think it is helpful. Behavioural, um, you see it a lot actually more than you think, more in the males than females that are concussed, but behavioural issues, um, short tempers become very irritable. It's hard to know, is it just they're annoyed because you've taken them off court, but actually is their normal behaviour like that? Are they more aggressive than they normally are? Is this an issue in itself? Cognitive, so this is where I think for basketball, basketball is a very high IQ sport, I think in comparison to some other sports, there's a lot going on and you can tell your decent player because it's not just ability, it is IQ. And you can quickly see when they're not doing things, particularly if you're heavily driven by, I don't know, whatever play you're using at the time or the process. Um, so again, are they doing it right? Are they out of place? Um, what's going on here? And then finally, sleep, which you won't know about, but this is the bit of, I'm worried about someone, but I think they're okay. Conversation will actually tell their parents, keep an eye on them, were there any issues, check in. If in 72 hours, three days, there were still no issues, then you're probably less worried at this point as well. So again, sleep disturbances are common. Okay. These questions are there for you in the B protocol now, but we are gonna look at, I think there's mileage to look at, are these the right questions? But these are the research questions that every sport currently uses with a few tweaks. Maybe we need to change some of ours and it'll be good to get your input into that later. Um, but these are kind of questions we should be asking if we're not sure and we think it's probably not a concussion. If there's anything to suggest it is, there's no point in even asking these questions, you're just taking them off. 
There are guidelines now, but we are reviewing them. I think one of the biggest overhauls of BE at the moment has been our medical side. We are trying to keep up. Um, this is myself and Andy now uh, with Steve and Charlie kind of managing us. Um, and we are trying to slowly change all these bits. Um, so do tell us um, and I'll give you my email later. Tell me if there's anything you think we should be looking at and trying to support you with. Okay, question for you. What clock is this? He wants to be on this side that's getting it all right. Okay. Um, which of the following sports has the most injuries requiring attendance to an emergency department? If you think it's A, horse riding, feel free to stand up. Or put your hand up. Fair yeah, no lifelines, you're out. <laughs> uh, if you think it's B, American football, stand up is the most. Okay, American football, yeah. Okay. Basketball? Football. Okay. So the answer for the most injuries attending the ED department, this isn't concussion, this is everything attending an emergency department, is basketball. By some way, interestingly. Um, this is NCAA data. So again... Sight. Fine. So I imagine we won't be too dissimilar for... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So many confounders, but you'd think that given there's so many other high risk sports, we're still up there. Okay. So, management wise, what are you going to do? So, recognize and remove is what we talked about. Um, I'm not going to go through these symptoms because they're not relevant to you, but the main things that I want to pick out are is someone floppy? Did they just flop? Did they fall down? When you fall down, you put your hands out instinctively. Someone falls down without their hands down, it's game over already because they haven't got a protective loss. Did they lose consciousness? Are they disorientated? Are they getting up and it looks odd? If, it, if they're getting up and it looks odd, it's game over. So we consider all these kind of things, category one uh, symptoms. That means they come off, it is over. There's no assessment required. I would argue that in a setting, if you haven't got a medical professional with you, so physio, sports therapist, someone else, then any symptoms like this, even if they're then fine, um, I think you should go to A&E for that to make sure we rule out a bleed because the risk is higher. Does that make sense? Um, so I'll send you this as well so you can see the list. I want to show you this. The video is less important. This is a few weeks ago for me. Rugby league. Both guys go down. I don't know if you can see that guy. When he falls, he falls with no protection at all. He's out for the count. His physio on the side, who's literally three meters away, but he's employed by the club, and there's a bias there, says that he is fine. There is no way that guy is fine. Does that make sense? Uh, you can see it on every video angle. We had to argue with the club, send video in to say he can't play, but you know, every single person here wouldn't have disagreed if you watched that back. Can you, can you play again so I can see what you mean about that? Yeah, yeah, of course can, yeah. So watch the guys as they go up. You see the guys, he falls down, comes up, comes up. He just goes straight down. But actually, that's a challenge for us. Even basketball, whatever it is, they're falling quite quickly. These are one second decisions. Um, I try and get our analysts to send us the video. Um, even if we're not sure at the end of the game and you decide, made your decision, get the video, relook at it and go, do I still agree with my decision? I don't think that's a bad thing to do. If you need to overturn it, you should do it. And you've got proof on the video. Um, so we do it all the time for any sport I work and I always want the video. So it depends on how good are your analysts. Most of you have got analysts in your team or video, so yeah. Okay. This is, a, this is literally a summary of what we've been talking about. It's called the uh, Pocket Concussion Recognition Tool. So I will uh, send this to you as well so you'll see it. Um, you can print it off. It's basically like an A5 size. Um, so again, this could be one of the things we leave with the referees. So I think that was quite a good idea. So maybe we need to look at what's the best format to leave the referees and what that looks like. Okay, if it's category one and two, I'm gonna give you the list anyway. Um, we'll work out a way that's simpler for you. Send them to hospital if there's no physio or doctor on site. I, I don't think that's unreasonable, but you're sending them to rule out a bleed, not to rule out a concussion. Yeah. Um, this is a critical challenge for me and Andy in basketball at the moment, is we're looking at how do we recruit people for, for our roles. If you don't see concussion on a day-to-day -day basis as a physio or as a doctor, then are you competent to deal with it? Are we any better than you to decide whether it is or isn't? I would argue no. So we have another challenge here is, actually you've got to decide on the strengths of your team and is that person appropriately 
competent to deal with it. Who does their appraisals? How do you check they're competent? And that requires that's the same for me or Andy or anyone else. Someone has to do everyone's competency. Um, and I think in basketball, we don't see enough concussions to be competent. So unless your physio, sports therapist or doctor is working in rugby or somewhere else, we're seeing enough, you know, do you need other support? But they, only they can tell you that. Um, so I think it's worth a conversation with them. But this is our overriding message over and over again. The hospital should not overturn any decision. It's not for them, it, but it's for us to make that message clear and make it clear before it gets undermined. Safeguarding, just worth considering. Um, what information are you giving the parents and the player? Because the player probably can't remember half of it after a while anyway. How old's a player? Is this a safeguarding issue? Who's at home? Is it someone to look after them? If they're going to end up staying on their own overnight, then that's not appropriate. We need to find someone else to stay with them to make sure nothing gets worse. Um, they shouldn't be driving if it's an older athlete. They need to leave their car. Someone needs to take it home for them. Um, and, you know, tell them when they need to go in. So those are our category one symptoms. So I'll make a list. Yeah. You take the kid off the court, okay? What would you advise as in first aid? Because obviously you can't go anywhere with them because let's say you're at an away game. Yeah. Right? And parents, bring the parents, but usually the parents want you to bring them home because they don't want them to go into the yeah. hospital wherever you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So do you give them an ice pack? Do you give them um, some sweets? Yeah. So um, what I'll do is I'll send you guys a list of symptoms that I think you should be going to hospital straight away for. Um, that we've kind of shown before, but I'll, sh I'll show you again clearly, so it's so hopefully very clear. Um, these symptoms, it doesn't matter what the parent says, this is what's happening. Um, I mean, it is difficult, isn't it? But it's trying to push that across. There are other things where you go, well, actually, you just need someone to keep an eye on, you don't need to go in. And it, the parent could do that. In a perfect world, longer term, we'd get all the parents educated to a basic level so you don't have some of the politics that happen with it and we have to find an easy mechanism to do that because it's not that easy is it um so maybe and um, this is i think part of some of the stuff coming out what guides do we need to produce that are simple straightforward that don't require a steep learning curve what can we do for the referees and table guys to pick it up you, you can yeah these are once they're registered there's the juniors and the parents registered online yeah part of that information will be to just send them this yeah so you know every parent from under 18 yeah. Registered with the Federation has had guidance or advice as well as all coaches, refs, players, officials okay. and players. Okay. I, I, think, I think that's the important thing to, rather than us trying to explain to the parents, yeah. if, if they've already done it as part of the registration. Yeah, you're on set. It's so much harder otherwise, isn't it? Yeah. Because I know when we had the Aspire, obviously, for one of the Aspire, the education session was on concussion, and I know I had some of my under 13s sat there with, oh my God, and it was like, I was trying to trying to get across that I'm not trying to scare them. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure that yeah. if they know that they don't feel okay, then they have to kind of come and tell us. But I think some of them were a little bit like, oh my goodness, with yeah. this whole thing on what is a concussion and stuff. Yeah. So I think it did kind of scare, especially some of the younger ones, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I find it's either works two ways. Either they understand the magnitude of it, and if they've got symptoms, they'll be honest because they're worried about their health. But there'll be other group that just want to play. They're too young to understand what health is yet, and it, it gives us the opposite problem, as you quite rightly point out. And I think that is a challenge with concussion. Just gonna so I'll leave these up, but I think return to school, all of those, I'll give you some advice. But ultimately, before they ever come back to basketball, they should have returned to school. They should have a few days off. They should only be going to school once all their symptoms are settled and there's a day or two gap. There's no hard and fast rule on this, um, but they shouldn't be doing exercise or any sport because that has more glucose requirements, um, but they also shouldn't be on their phones. So the first thing we tell all our players is no phones, no TV, should be the most boring few days of your life. But actually the reason why is because we want their glucose consumption to be kept low, as we talked about before. Okay, so return to play to finish off. So. What do you do to get them back? Just so you've got an idea of guidelines and timescales. Again, this is on the guidelines for you. So if you're an adult, how many of you are looking after seniors? Or are most, this is a few seniors. Okay, so if you're looking after seniors, this is standard care. And I talked through accelerator and standard. So standard care is you haven't got any medical input. You're generally doing it yourself. 
they need to 14 days stand down time. The reason for 14 days is it takes some, we think it takes somewhere between seven and 10 days for the glucose repair system to work long enough, but that is the average person. It will, some people will be more, some people will be less. So we've got that 14 days, that's their rest, but they need to slowly come back. So it's not pure rest, it's the same as loading any injury. You're slowly coming back. So you slowly start to introduce some schoolwork, you slowly start to introduce walking, and you do other things in the meantime, okay. Uh, by two, so if they've done that and they're fine, then you can go to light aerobic exercise. That is very light. So uh, for the guys using heart rates and stuff, you're talking kind of 50-60% of heart rate. So you, not a lot. They should be comfortably able to have a good conversation with you. They shouldn't be someone who's taxed. Uh, they should be able to finish the 15 minutes without necessarily feeling fatigued. If that goes okay for 24 hours, then you start to increase it. Then we can look at shooting drills and things that are non-contact, but start to bring a technical skill or more cognitive component and you guys can make that as interesting as you want and also you can work on things they might need to work on but actually I'd argue don't make it too complex if they're weaker at that skill now's not the time to practice it because uh, they're already slow enough as it is so maybe stick to stuff they're stronger at that is more uh, things they do innately um, that might be better here and then you slowly bring it up and we've got these in the guidelines already and again it might be worth looking at it with some of you guys going could we do other interesting things with this progression instead because obviously we've written it and you guys might go there might be better drills to do and that might be good because it might be disseminating into more junior coaches who might find that more useful okay once all of that is done and you've done full training then before we go to game time where the risk is highest then it does need a medical clearance. That is a national consensus and international consensus. If you don't have a medic as a doctor on site, then that is where your GP or someone has to sign you off. And this is one of our biggest challenges at the moment is because a lot of GPs go, I don't want to take the risk and sign you off. Um, we are exploring whether we need to work out at what point of B this stops, but we might be doing remote sign off for you. It might be something we need to manage remotely and support you with. And um, we need to work out that mechanism but there are enough staff in place now that B never used to have. So it's something we should be able to support you with. It's just working out how and making it realistic. Um, okay, so, so that's adult. I'm not gonna go through every single one the same way, but you can see the rest period is what's gonna change. So this is standard care for someone under 19. So this is a junior. So they've got 23 days, same rest time, but instead of 24 hours, you've got two days in every stage. So it's just longer. And it's longer because kids take longer to manage. Enhanced care, so this is what we're trying to sort out for you guys, is if you've got a doctor, you've got baseline testing, where we've done tests beforehand, which can easily be done at the club, um, and we've got a way to help you with imaging, then we can get you back quicker, if it's appropriate. So for an adult, you can get back within a week. That's a massive time difference at elite level. Um, but I'd argue that if it's lower level, why take the risk with someone? At elite level, you might want to accelerate. You can also accelerate guys seven to eight, 17 and 18 years old. It's slightly longer, it's around 12 days. And actually that's what we ended up doing, didn't we, for that tournament. So as a key player, you needed to get her back. She was progressing well, but actually we were managing in Ireland, I think at the time, you know, it's not easy. Um, but again, the more conversation we have, the more we smooth this process out the easier it is than having those conversations for the first time away with both of us going, well, what's the best way to manage this remotely? Okay. So I'm gonna leave these challenges with you, but this is our main challenge. We've talked about it. So we will look at education and I will send that back to you. It'd be really good to get your input on what education looks like. Have a look at this if you haven't. This is World Rugby. Do um, an e-learning module, it's free, um, aimed at general public and coaches in sport. Um, so parents could do this well and it looks at recognising it, what to do. Um, it's, it's very good. They uh, do it every year as well. Um, I'm going to send you these slides. These are our main things, aren't they, really? A decision is never overturned and that's what you'll get from this uh, e-learning. But if the parents buy in and they get that, then they're off your case a little bit too. Okay, our challenges. These are some of the things we've had this year. Uh, that me and Andy have both had. So um, parents going, I will sign off my child um, and they're fine. We can't, we can't do that, can we? Um, but you know, they don't mean it. They don't mean it in a bad way. Most of them it's because they truly didn't understand it. And I think some of that is a challenge on us. How do we make them understand it better? Um, the lower threshold mantra we've been talking about. Coaches sometimes, I think it's less in basketball. I think there's definitely football, we get it a lot. It's not a concussion, he's fine. 
Um, I've had the owner come into our rugby league uh, change room while I'm assessing it, he's fine. He pays my salary, what do I do now? You know, it, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, so I guess it's getting on board with a, well, maybe it's not, but is the mechanism enough that you want to have a lower threshold? And that's a conversation and it's variable, isn't it? Um, and this is our big thing. What do we do with emergency departments? So I want to finish by talking you through this. If we want to change any practice, this is the Nuffield Council Biothics Ladder of Intervention. Have you seen this before? So if we want to change any practice, it's one framework to do it. So I'm going to do it for smoking and I'm going to let you think about how you might do it for something else. If your population or your children or your players or the parents don't want to listen to you, but you want to change them, what can we do? Well, we can nudge them, we can educate them, we can give them leaflets, we can give them e-learning. But if your kids or your parents go, well, I still like smoking, I don't care that it's got black lungs, I get that you've educated me, but I don't care, they still do it, then we need to push them down the direction we want them to take. So shoves could be we incentivise them. How we do this for concussion, I'm all ears uh, later, do we incentivise them? So for smoking, that was make cigarettes more expensive it was take advertising away. Does that make sense? You're pushing them down the direction you want to go. How do we do that concussion? Not sure. Um, if that doesn't work, we've pushed them and they still won't do it, then we've got to smack them. So in effect, we're saying to them, we're taking all choice away from you. This is mandated, this is legislation, which is kind of what we have, but there's too many greys in it. So for smoking, that was the smoking ban, wasn't it? That's the only thing that really, truly made a difference nationwide and has changed culture. So for us, what does a smack look like? How do we make sure that people do look after their players? Does that make sense? Cool. So based on that, I guess these are the main uh, key points I wanted to leave you with. It is extremely important. I think sometimes because they don't look unwell, we, we sometimes lose that importance. Um, we need to recognise and remove. Um, we are exploring e-learning and modules around this. And any of you that are up for helping me test this, I'd really be grateful for your input. Hopefully it won't take too long. Um, if you could leave your emails with Brian, um, then that will be amazing. And I'll follow up with you on that. Um, have a management plan. So in your club, what are you going to do to manage this? So if there is a concussion, who do they see? Where do they go? How does that work? And if you're not sure, come and... Uh, email me and at least I'll have a look in your local area and tell you who the key contacts could be uh, and when to do it. Um, and ultimately we are here for support. Uh, so Andy is here a few days a week. I don't want to commit to how many days he is. Uh, and I've got uh, roughly a day a week with England basketball. So there's enough time to help you. Um, you just need to ask us if, you, if, if we can. So hopefully that gives you a quick whistle stop tour through concussion. Um, but really grateful for the ideas I think some of you generated. So hopefully we can action those over the next couple of weeks with at least a draft or something that you guys can uh, bite your teeth into and comment on. Is there any questions at all? Cool. All right. Thank you very much, Dan.